ông quay cho ông chúng tôi chụp ra bắt cả mặt to cái chấm đa ca hay nâng trồng cùn vịt cá chun từ cầm mấy vịt cá bị cái đây lục yên gì là mấy to cá tăng phân bổ đánh đầu chụp bùa nãy chấm liền để biết chân là tôm chừng thank you mr president and good afternoon mr president your honors and good afternoon to everyone in and around the courtroom and very good afternoon to you, sir. Professor Chandler, uh, I just have a few uh, topics, very short. And they're not in any particular order. I'm just going to continue. clarify a few matters. So the first one uh, deals with the, the black book which you have written about in your text, uh, Brother Number One. It's E 3 slash 17. That's the document number. And I'm going to be referring in particular to page 71 of your book, Brother number one, this is the 1999 position, page 71, it's 00392985. And I believe the Khmer is 0082173436, somewhere in that vicinity. I'm going to read a line from it, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions. You say, first of all, let me, let me before I ask any questions, you're familiar with the black book that I'm referring to, the Leave Noir. Yes, I am. Uh, okay. Well, I'll read it again. Here on page 71, you say the Libre Noir is a melange of truth, reconstructed history, and wishful thinking. And that's the one sentence that I want to focus on a little bit. Uh, and it seems, it would, it would seem that uh, this is a conclusion that you've drawn uh, based on your historical analysis as much of what the, uh, the Khmer Rouge, especially the leadership, has, has produced. But in particular with this, this, uh, this black book, when looking at it, you see it as a melange of truth, reconstructed history, and wishful thinking. Oh, I'm sorry. Was, was there a question there? I'm, I'm, I was reading the text myself. I'm, I, I missed the question. It's my fault. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, it's your interpretation, at least from based on your uh, as a historian, based on what you, you know of the events and what you've read in the past. When you read this, this book, the black book, you, uh, you concluded that it was based partly on truth, 
Partly reconstruction of history, revisionism, as some would call it, in part wishful thinking. That's your interpretation of, of the text itself, right? The contents of it. Yes, it is. Uh, this, this sentence, of course, as in relation, uh, comes at the part of my discussion of the text that deals with the 66-67 period, but I do say that is true of the entire book as well. And would you say that you could attribute, you could say the same thing about many of the other things that were produced by the, the Khmer Rouge leadership, for instance, such as uh, the revolutionary flag, if one were to look at them, that are other documents that one finds that, that, that there is a melange of <laughs> truth, reconstructed history, and wishful thinking in many of these documents. Would that be a pattern or something that they engaged in? Uh, certainly, but I think the difference with the Leave Noir and the, uh, uh, the uh, Tung Bati Water revolutionary flags is this is a, a book of history in quotation marks intended for the outside world, so it's an even stronger example of this than, and uh, looking at that phrase itself, I, I think every of us in the room can realize that every day we spend of our own lives is a melange of truth, <laughs> reconstructed history, which will think this is how people behave, but this document is not a reliable piece of historical text, I did mean to say that, it does resemble other uh, communist documents in that sense, but it was, it was aimed at a larger audience, and so it was aimed at giving a history of, again in quotations please, a history of uh, Vietnamese Khmer relations that I think would definitely fit this uh, sentence that I've written. Right. And, and, and I appreciate that, but, but also if I could, uh, if we could talk in more general terms also with respect to documents that were produced for internal consumption, uh, has it been your understanding of uh, sifting through uh, primary and secondary sources that uh, the, uh, they did engage in rewriting history. You know, good example would be, for instance, as to when the party was founded and uh, some of the events that might have preceded the fall of uh, Phnom Penh either glorifying you know, their, uh, their actions in their accomplishments or diminishing the part participation of others. You know, just to give you some examples. Yes, I agree entirely with that uh, assessment of yours just now. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we could go on to another, uh, something slightly different, another topic. Uh, again, this is from uh, brother number one. Uh, we've had some discussions yesterday. We talked about what had been going on uh, with the bombings. And we talked a little bit about your testimony as far as people joining the Khmer Rouge. But here I want to focus you on the introduction to your book. Again, this is E317, and in particular, this one part on page 76, and I'll read the part and then I'll ask you a question. Uh, you say, over the next four years, Inkshree and other high-ranking members of the party lived and worked among these people. Over the years, the people of Ratanakiri, Krache, and Montanakiri had grown increasingly hostile to the Phnom Penh government as roads, rubber plantations, settlers, and, and, and foresters advanced into their hands. Quote, they hated all the Khmer, quote, a party member later recalled. Now, just that part I want to focus on a little bit. Uh, and, and ask you if you could first uh, say, would you still 
do you still do you still stand by what you wrote here? No, I can hear nothing that sound. No, you can hold about that. Go, go, man, say nothing. The panic directly. Yes, I do. Right. And, uh, from reading this, it would appear that in addition to what might have been happening uh, with the bombings, and I understand you qualified it that 73, we really see the uh, sort of indiscriminate bombing in many ways by the U.S., but before that there were some bombing in, in certain areas. But we see that there are a host of other reasons that you've identified that at least the people in these areas uh, It's all right, it's all right. I'll let you get yourself settled again. It seems <laughs> I didn't think I could have that effect on you, Professor. Uh, but it seems that here you're saying that there's a host of some other reasons as well that at least the people in those areas would feel some animosity towards the Phnom Penh government, as you put it, such as uh, rubber plantation, the building of roads. In other words, it seems that their, their way of, of uh, livelihood or their way of living is being impacted in a negative way, at least the way they saw it. Would that be true? Absolutely. And would this be one reason, in addition to maybe other reasons, uh, that perhaps some of these people might have joined the revolution or at least were receptive to what they were hearing from those who were attempting to lead this revolution uh, to, uh, against the, uh, the government of Phnom Penh. ในจํานวนของอาตอนคลอยตอบจําสําหรับได้ยิน Your Honours, if I was to ask the question in these terms, my learned friend would be on his feet and he knows full well um, that this is not a proper question. It, it uh, requires the professor to opine as to the state of mind of third parties and their opinions. If I may, Your Honour, uh, use a technique used by the prosecution uh, based on your historical uh, are you in a position to give us an opinion whether these reasons that you've identified in your book would be a cause uh, for the people living in those areas to be receptive or to be, to, to be angry at the Phnom Penh government. And if you're not able to answer the question, by no means speculate. No, I think it's a good question. We have quite a bit of evidence that many of these uh, tribal people did join the party at this time, or join the movement, maybe not members of the party. Uh, thank you. If we could move on to uh, another topic, and this is the topic of biographies. And I know I said I wasn't going to go into going to the transcript, and I don't intend to, but just merely in the event you wish to look at it, so you know uh, what areas I'm, I'm referring to. But on 20th July uh, 2012, you were asked a series of questions, or there was an exchange concerning the use of biographies. And you see that on page 15 to 16, and that would be on or about the time there is slightly before 9.09.3. 9 .09 and again, there's an exchange on page 19, 118 and 119. Look with me, but yet, I'm going to go to the Yes. Uh, 
Um, th uh, thank you, Mr. President. There are two exchanges on 20th of July. The first one is on page 15 and 16 in, in the English version. And the timer would be somewhere around 09.35.07. And the second exchange is on page 18, uh, 118. And 119, and the timer there would be 15, 15.0809. I'm not interested in going into necessarily what you said. I just wanted to point that out. In the event uh, you're interested. What I, am, what I do wish to share with you is your answer on 6 August 2009. And if we look at, we should have a hard copy or should we, we should have it on the screen. I don't know which one. It's D288 slash 4.59.1. This is the transcript from the Doig trial. And the Khmer version, the Khmer RN number is 00. 361492. The English is 0036 And the French is 0036 And this is on page 32, and it goes on Long to page 33. Starting on line 15, you're asked a question. And I believe this was the questioning by Judge Cartwright. Would I be correct in inferring that biographies of ordinary cadres at S21 became a source for, of information for the regime to identify its enemies or was there some less sinister purpose? And your answer at Doik to this question was, no, I, think the, I don't think there is any sinister purpose in making or requesting members of the staff of S21 to prepare biographies. This was just something that party people and military people have to do from time to time. I think, no, I would say this was not the purpose. It was just a practice that was universal. The people didn't mind, or maybe they did, but it was a required activity. And so I think it was just one of the normal features of life at the prison and probably at other offices throughout the country except that these, the difference that these other autobiographical documents have not survived whereas those connected with S21 have survived. Have you, have you been able to, to follow me uh, as I read along? Yes, I'm just amazed at the technology, frankly. <laughs> but yes, I have. <coughs> I am too. Uh, wasn't like that when I first started. Uh, do you stand by this answer that you gave the DOI? Uh, and let me just say, in conjunction to what you told us uh, in this courtroom as well, to the questions posed to you on the 20th. I hope the statements coincided, because I certainly agree with this statement of 2009. If they don't coincide, this statement seems to me an accurate statement. Right. so, I know the focus, the thrust of the questioning in Doik was uh, S21, but it seems, from what you're saying, is from, based on your research, that this was an ongoing practice in other places or other institutions or uh, offices, and nothing sinister 
in and of itself. The, the, the writing of a biography was not being sinister in and of itself. That's what you seem to be saying. Have I summarized your position fairly and succinctly? Yes, but certainly. Uh, it was a nice summary, but the people outside the party, people, no people in the 17th people, I think, uh, perhaps the ones that the Civil Party voters were referring to, did feel these questions were intrusive and sinister because they'd never been asked to do them before. They didn't know what use was going to be put to these uh, uh, facts that they were setting down. Uh, and I think in some cases, uh, certainly new people, the party was going to use that information to see what they could do. Inside the party, it's just to make you a better party person. That's not the same thing. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, if I can also, uh, today, uh, I believe you mentioned, I think it was today, the days are sort of uh, merging, but today you indicated that it was your opinion uh, that uh, Son Sen uh, was number three. Not, not that I am quarreling with that, but as I recall this morning, you had indicated during you know, the one exchange that we had that he was known or some reputed him to be number three. Is that correct? You stand by that. Yes, the way it's worded, I do, yes. Uh, thank you. Now, in, in, in the Doig trial on 6 August 2009, and this is the Khmer is 00361534, English 00361436, and French 00361689. And you indicated on, on uh, this will be page 98 of the transcript, line 15. I think in the southwest, Tamak had more autonomy than the leaders of the other zones. He was a very powerful person. Number three, as you say, in the hierarchy, and was not going to take orders from anyone except Pol Pot. And then you go on. So here, I know you, it's slightly different than what you're saying here today, but suffice it to say, uh, would you stand by your positions today and on Doig that Tamak and Sun Sen are sort of neck to neck, a number three or number three and number four, either in that order or the reverse order? Yes, there's contradictory evidence that would make it sound uh, the way you put it exactly. Uh, thank you. And then my last, the last uh, question, I mean, or the last topic, I should say, because uh, I don't want to but do have a habit of saying that's the last question and then asking a bunch of other questions. Um, but the last uh, question, uh, I've come across uh, some of your write, uh, a particular piece of writing where you, you seem to indicate, and this is in connection to a question that was raised yesterday by the Nun Chia team, where you seem to indicate the, that the, at least in the 1980s, I'm not going to refer to a document, I'm just going to give the thrust of, the, of, of uh, what you seem to be saying, and then ask you whether you agree or disagree, that in the 1980s, the PRK helped to channel or to construct a narrative of collective memories that more or less suited their own political, uh, that was politically useful for them, for the present and for the past. And then, uh, 
you seem to be going on to say that sometimes these, the, uh, these collective memories become the dominant narrative in a sense reality. Now, without asking whether this is what you wrote, if, you could, if you're in a position today to recall or to tell us whether that is in fact how you view things from a historian's uh, point of view, uh, two things. The first answer is uh, yes, I certainly wrote that and I concur with what I said. I did question, or maybe not, it's not my role as a witness to do this, but I'm wondering if uh, 1979 materials are to be discussed in detail or not. I wrote that, I admit that I wrote that, and it's fine, but I've got ready to go on and say, oh, that's fine, let's keep talking about 79, 80, whatever, I don't want to do that unless I'm directed to do so. Well, uh, based on that, let me ask one or two more questions. What I'm interested in is when you say, when you talk about a collect, collective memory that are consistent with the, sort of the political agenda, um, the reason I'm asking this is that some may either create documents or uh, assist in the uh, uh, witnesses. I'm not saying that that's, the ha that's happened today, but in the past, it has a narrative no being created whereby perhaps it might affect people's uh, memory to adequately recount the events as they occurred at the time because the memories have been tainted with. And I'm, I'm based on this, based on what you're saying, if I'm misstating it or mischaracterizing it or misunderstanding it, please correct me, but that's the only thing I'm trying to do. Well, Your Honours, we've heard objections from the defence on the basis that the professor is not uh, especially qualified to opine on the impact on events, of the, uh, the events might have on populations in terms of psychology. Um, and, and we would simply place the same objection to this question that requires the professor to enter into an area that, as far as we know, hasn't studied the impact of narratives post-79 on people's psychological states and their preparedness to testify truthfully or otherwise. Mr. President, while I would generally, generally agree with the gentleman, uh, Professor Chandler has indicated that he did in fact uh, write that and maintained his position. I'm merely asking for a clarification. If he's unable to answer the question without engaging in a host of spe uh, speculative aspects of, his, of, of what he wrote, that's fine. If he's able to answer the question, I certainly I think it's within the trial chamber's interest to, he to hear because the whole point of the, this trial is to get a proper and accurate narrative. សេចក្តីយប់ទោសនឹងសម្អាងហេតុនៃក្រិយចំទោសរបស់តំណាងសហភាពញ៉ាសំស្របអង្គជាប់មិនចាំបាច់ច្ដាប់នៅចម្លើ
the objection was sustained. You need not answer the question. Uh, Professor Chen, on behalf of uh, Ms. Ing Ms. Ng Ng I would like to thank you for coming here to give your evidence. We wish you the best of luck in safe travels. Thank you very much and thank you, Your Honors, for the time and expense to examine Professor Chandler. Thank you very much for the time and expense to uh, just a very brief reply. I'm grateful for that last uh, sentence, and it has indeed been a, a very interesting experience for me to undergo these uh, very skillfully placed uh, 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 questions, and I wish you the same luck you wished me. Thank you very much. អត់ជាកិច្ចបន្តអង្គរិយាសម្ដល់វិធីការជឿនទៅក្រុមមេតាវីការពីក្តី <coughs> ចំពោះសួរលោកសាស្ត្រាចារ្យដាវីដឆានលើផងដែរខ្ញុំ <coughs> I'm listening in English largely because I don't remember how to operate all these buttons, but I can understand most of the command when I hear it over the top of the... Oh, uh, yes, English is the answer to the question. ບາດໄດ້ຊລາຍສໍານວນນີ້ພັນຄຽມບານ <laughs> ពីពីសាខ្មែរមកអង់គ្លេសនេះវាអាចទៅធ្វើការចន្លោះដូចនេះលោកអាចមើលទៅហាក់ដូចជាមិនតាន់ពេលវេលាអញ្ចឹងខ
วียมีนชีจำนวนเพียจานหรือมวยกอบเพียติดในเปเปเลในการสร้างชีวิตบอลโลกinterviewed people speaking Vietnamese or Thai, so mostly in some commercial situations I used interpreter and some I did not. I guess that's what you'd want to know. จะมวยปลอดขมายหายโลกมันมีนเนี่ยบอกปลายตัวจะมวยตัวโลกมีนปัญหาไว้คละโครงการตำแหน่งตำแหน่งจะมวยเนี่ยได้โลกตัวสมเพียรนุเตบ่าสมอคุณคุณอาจจะสมบัญชีโลกสาลังเวงทาตามสมเด็จระบบโลกเพียสาขมายระบบโลกได้ปราบปราสำหรับตำแหน่งตำแหน่งทุกกาสายเชียวนู้คือมีนกำรัดยังทำตรายเต Well, certainly, my communicate my uh, interviews in Cambodia are, are somewhat limited. Yes, but I have a, I feel I've got a pretty good comprehension of Khmer and uh, use it with quite a bit of confidence. Or did at least when the 80s and 90s when I was doing this research. But certainly the limitations. French isn't my native language either, and I feel there are limitations there. But I don't ever use an interpreter when I uh, interview people in French. บ่าสมอคุณคุณสมสูรบัญชีอัมพีสถานอภิเษกในเปรโลกบอกประอาบภูการสายเชียวนู้บันไทยบันไทยท่าในเปรโลกสะสูรตัวเลือบกุลน้ำมันเนี่ยตาลูกสูรจีเลกระดาษสำงานแต่ปีเนี่ยบกุลนู้หรือขนมสถานอภิเษกดามีนมันนึกดอกไตเตียนในขบายหนึ่งจานฮะดามีนกาบัญชีบัญชูบัญชูยุบบอลเอจดาม Well, that, uh, that entirely depends on the context. Some of the, some of the interviews were conducted in private, and others were conducted in rooms where other people were listening. It depended on the nature of material I was looking for. Uh, the kind of questions I was asking were not were not really very yeah. Embarrassing in any cases. Uh, so uh, yeah, sometimes there were people there, uh, and sometimes they weren't. <laughs> โลกเมียนได้จบสถานเพียบได้ทาเนเปได้โลกสมเพียชมุกก้อกับปันแต่บุกลคอจินเนชลายจำนวนเป็นเมียนได้จบสถานเพียบแบบนั้นเต้ I can't specifically remember such a thing No, it was not the question. I, I see what you're saying. If we'd ask a question, then someone else in the room would say, oh, the real answer is such and such. I don't remember I did team interviews like that. I'm not sure that uh, but if I did it, it might have happened, I, but I can't remember the specific case. Certainly, I should add, certainly my, the people I interviewed never came along with uh, spokespeople who were speaking for them and 
were directing my questions, were saying my my friend won't answer that question because it was not a legal situation in that sense. Be someone else in the room would not be a spokesperson guiding the conversation from the point of view of the other person. I was never in that situation. បាទសមគមចាក់ទៅនឹងពេលវេលាលោកអាចជម្រាបក្រុមប្រឹក្សាជំនុំរាវបានលើថាតើភាគច្រើនការសំភាររបស់លោកនេះចាប់ពីពេ
In other words, I was not seeking uh, some sort of prosecuting evidence. I was seeking information as best I could. I listened to everything I could find. Well, that, that was a very uh, difficult ask. I don't think you could talk to survivors of the Khmer Rouge regime and get a completely uh, balanced, impartial, and neutral view. There were uh, people who had a neutral view of the uh, of decay, seemed to me. Well, let me say I've never found a person who had a neutral view of de democratic Cambodia. I found some who would uh, approve of the regime. I thought their testimony was very interesting. I found others who disapproved. Their testimony was also interesting. <laughs> บ่สมอคุณខ្ញុំសូមទីនរំលោកទៅចំណុចថ្មីទៀតទងទៅនឹងលោកខៀវសំផនទៅលោកបានស្គាល់លោកខៀវសំផនពីមុនមកទេ but I should add, I, I certainly knew him by uh, reputation throughout his career, some, some, and uh, I followed his career with interest, but personally I've had no, uh, no contact with him. Well, they were synonymous in the period that I was in Cambodia, 1960 to 62, my first time here. He was well known as a very, uh, as a person with uh, extreme and rather bewildering uh, integrity. Uh, he was admired by people who admired integrity. He was, uh, uh, I think, again, I'm sorry, one of the, I think, I think Sinuk was a little bit frightened of him because of that very quality. This was a person, uh, his reputation was such that he was not uh, viable, he couldn't be uh, bought. Uh, this was a reputation that was uh, among uh, the crony circle of Sinuk's uh, era was very rare indeed. So I had heard of them in a positive uh, framework, of course. I have to add, I was working for the American Embassy, and we were interested also that he was a person of pronounced left-wing views. That was, a, was known as, that was fine also. That was a piece of information. But what was around, what one could pick up about him from Cambodians I spoke to, uh, by and large, a uh, good deal of, of, of um, how should we say, uh, admiration. I left in 62, so that's, that's the last time I was in town with when he was there. បាទសូមអរគុណខ្ញុំចង់សូមឲ្យលោកបញ្ជាក់ទៅលើចម្លើយរបស់លោកអំបាញ់មិញដែលថាសម្ដេចនរដមសៀនុមានការ <coughs> Well, he was just, I, I've tried to say it before, I'm not, I'm not saying that your following question is very good, but uh, he was just the kind of person that Sino didn't know how to deal with. He had no uh, experience with people uh, that he couldn't uh, dominate, manipulate, uh, influence, uh, purchase, uh, rent, uh, all these kinds of words uh, you might use about his, his political style with, uh, with uh, associates. And he's admitted in his own writings that one of the reasons he placed uh, Hun Sen in office in the uh, Department of Commerce was to see if he could 
uh, join the team, as it were. And uh, Kia Sapan's performance as a uh, sub-cabinet minister was uh, not marked by the slightest corruption. So this is the kind of thing I think what uh, concerned Sihanouk was that this was a person, uh, not only they did, did they didn't like, there are many, many people he didn't like, but someone who was able to uh, operate on a different set of moral guidelines from his uh, associates. Certainly not. I don't know how it got onto the channel. I, I was speaking entirely of Sienu. And of this early period, also the 60s, I'm not, I'm not mentioning Hun Sen at all. Nor did I mention Hu Nim or Hu Yuan, whose names might sound a little bit like Hun Sen to a translator, but those names had not yet come into discussion either. បាទសូមអរគុណខ្ញុំយល់ហាត់ដូចជាអត់ទៅច្បាស់ហើយខ្ញុំជឿថាអង្គជំនុំជម្រាបប្រហែលជាអាចយល់មិនច្បាស់
kiss of Mons autobiography. These people were opposed to him, and they were working not to overthrow him, certainly not to support his continuing rule over Cambodia. Uh, so he was he was getting uh, nervous, and when Sinuk got nervous, he got aggressive. And I think uh, my impression, I have this, have this confirmed from Q Sampan's autobiography, which I have to revisit, I get the feeling that Q Sampan um, felt that this threat might go further than uh, words, that it might take a physical form, and I think he may well have been correct in thinking that, because Sinuk had already ordered uh, severe punishments on people. So that was the reason he fled. <coughs> or left Phnom Penh. I, I don't know use fled. I just left Phnom Penh. <coughs> ហើយបានចាក់ចេញទៅនឹងតាមមានសញ្ញាណអ្វីឬក៏សកម្មភាពអ្វីដែលបញ្ជាក់ធ្វើឲ្យលោកខៀវសំផលនឹងភ័យខ
Yes, and uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm only suggesting a member of the party. I know he was not a member of the Standing Committee apparently until 1971, so I'm not saying that. Member of the party, uh, if I turn out to be misinformed, I'll be able to tell you that tomorrow, but I'm almost certain this was the case. បាទសូមអរគុណលោកអាចបញ្ជាក់ពីពេលវេលាផងបានទេថាតើអើពេលវេលានឹងចាប់ពីពេលណាមកដល់ពេលណាដែលថាលោកជាសម្ព័ន្
Or rather, I can answer at any time. There were no open members of the CPK. All memberships were secret from anybody but the, mem the fellow members. If you were a member, you were a secret member. There was no open member. And I will answer the question about his being a member, which is to say a secret member, uh, when, I, when and if I get that information from what I've got in my room. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to seem in any way uncooperative, but uh, I think that's been made clear through other testimony that this was not a party operating in the open uh, at any time after 19... Oh, it, was, it never operated in the open until, uh, really, until uh, 1977. So, secret member is a member, same thing. Bác Yom, Sua Lok Am Pi, Tu Nhi Ti Rô Bọt Lok Khe Sum Phon, Nơi Khăn Nông, Pạc Kô Mình Nhi Kàm Bù Chia, Ta Lok Ai Chlai Bàn, Tế Mô Tây, Nơi Pê Nhi. I hope so. I hope we can help you. Yes, I do. Ba so mau kun. Ta lok dang tha lok khieu som phon chol chia som a chek mat chom triem ne pe na te. Uh, yes, 1971. <laughs> uh, yes, you just uh, wait for me 30 seconds. This was one thing I was asked before. I looked it up and I found it, and then I was not asked the following day, so let's see what I've put in my notebook. Just a second. My writing is just terrible. Oh, okay. Just a second. Okay, uh, it was in, um, he became a candidate member of the Central Committee in uh, 1971, and the source I used there that was from the closing order, but it was an open, apparently open document, the written record of interview with Hugh Sampan, document, that's footnote double 435, paragraph 1130 of the closing order. So that, that was in Kusampan's own words, in other words, when he became a member. He became a full right member in July 1976. That's the same text of Kusampan's. Yes, 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 បាទខ្លាយទៀតអាចសូមឲ្យគាត់បញ្ជាក់សំណួរចំឡើយចុងក្រោយរបស់គាត់នេះបន្តិចលោកវិធានសំលោកខ្ញុំនេះសូមបញ
referred to a statement, a written statement by Q Sampan interview of interview with the uh, trial. I think I don't know with the trial. It was, it's a trial document, and it's, so it's his own words. So too, the date of his becoming a full rights member in 1976. Uh, the same text drawing there on footnote 4639. So these are his own statements. I mean, uh, we can, I think, we can go ahead this way, but it, it seems not entirely fruitful, but that's not, I shouldn't, I'm not in a position to say that. ពេលនេះទីចាប់ពីពេលនេះទៅទៅរហូតដល់ម៉ោង 3 ក្រសួងបញ្ជើញជល់វិញដើម្បីមកតកចំណើការសម្ណាការមន្ត្រីរដ្